Year's Eve and Christmas and all that, and I felt like it, time, time's just moving too fast, man. But like, you know, to recap on February, we release merch. Can you make some noise for merch? Let's go. If you didn't make any noise, that means you didn't buy any. So we still have some left. Go buy it. <laughs> and yeah, you know, I, I saw like some adults upstairs. They already started wearing it. Some of you guys probably already bought it, but you guys choose not to wear it because you don't want to twin with the person next to you. But that's okay. I see you guys twinning. Y'all cute. Nice. <laughs> but yeah, last week we also had ice skating. Who, who went to ice skating? Who fell at ice skating? Not me. Wow, hell bozo. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, we, we had ice skating, yo, Valentine's Day. That's what's up. And like, I, I, I didn't get a Valentine's Day card, but like, it, it's all good, G. It's all good. But like, you know, all, some of us want a Valentine's Day card, but we're not reading our Bible where it's like the, it, it, it's the, the greatest love letter from Jesus to us, you know? But like, that's like, that's all I'm saying. So that's why I read my Bible during Valentine's Day. Because I know if no one loves me, at least Jesus loves me. Ah, that's not even my sermon yet, but okay. <laughs> hey, thanks, man. Um, but yeah, so to give context to the topic that I want to talk about today and also the verses that we're going to read, we're going to go to when Jesus and his disciples were um, eating at the upper room. This is a few hours before Jesus is going to be arrested. And some of you guys, a lot of you guys might know it as the, la uh, the Last Supper. If you guys don't know the actual story, you guys might know the painting and all that. But yeah, this was a few hours before Jesus was arrested. And in this, um, in this passage we're going to read, well, during this Last Supper, Jesus wasn't just like, you know, having a meal or hanging out, but he was also telling the disciples like, yeah, I'm a dip, you know, I'm a be arrested. And this is what you're going to do after I'm gone. You know, a lot of these included teaching, some warnings, and also assurance that everything is going to be okay. Because I bet they were like confused, they were stressed because, you know, this, this man that they were following all this time, he's going to just leave. He's just going to be arrested, you know, taken away. So to start, let's open up to John 15, uh, verse 9 through 15. But we're just going to read verse 9 first. Uh, can we read this together? One, two, three. I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love and do not doubt my love for you. Okay, we can stop there for now. So right here, the passage, it starts with how Jesus loves his disciples in the same way the Father loves him. You know, I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. And this is so important because it describes that the love of Jesus for the disciples, it's, it's the same love as a father would to his own children, you know. So what, what does that mean? This means that this love, it has no beginning nor an end. And this love, it's close. It's personal. This love also is unchanging. And this is the sort of love that, this, uh, that Jesus wants his disciples to experience. And it's also the same kind of love that Jesus wants everyone else to experience, that he wants the disciples to even share with other people. So... The title of my sermon is uh, Forever Like This. And some of you guys may think if you guys see my other sermons like, wow, Gil, that's not depressing at all. That's not like, <laughs> but in all seriousness, like I, I was listening to this song. It was called, uh, it's called First Love by Carrie Job, right? It's like, like when I'm down in the dumps, that's like my song. We're just like, I'll be singing in the car by myself or sometimes with my sister. She doesn't appreciate it. She'd be saying like, yo, stop singing. Just like let her sing. You're not, that's why you didn't make the song, you know? But like there's this one part in the bridge that goes, I feel my heart beating out of my chest. I want to stay forever like this. May the flame of my heart always be lit. I want to burn forever like this. So this love that Jesus is saying to his disciples, it's somewhere that they can remain in forever, you know? Because like forever like this, this is the kind of 
love that Jesus wants us to experience too. And I hope that we can remain in this love too. So like, okay, I, I want us to get closer to Jesus, you know, and to just remain in him, to stay with him. But how can we do that? Well, there's this word that if you look at the other translations of this verses, it's called abide, which also means to stay or remain. You know, to stay or remain in Jesus' love. The thing is, like, why does Jesus want us to stay in his love so badly? Why does, <coughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> like, why, why does Jesus want us to stay or remain? Or what does it even mean to stay in the love of Jesus? You know, uh, can we open back up to verses 9 through 11? John 15, 9 through 11. Um, can we read this together? One, two, three. I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love and do not doubt my love for you. If you keep my commandments and obey my teaching, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that my joy and delight may be in you and that your joy may be made full and complete and overflowing. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jeremy. And when we read like verse 10, right? It says to remain in Jesus' love. We need to keep his commandments and obey his teaching. Similar to how he himself kept the commandments of the Father and how he obeyed the teachings of the Father as well. But I think one quick note that a lot of us sometimes forget about Jesus is that Jesus was a really good leader as he was a teacher, as he was a preacher, you know? And he's still a good leader in our lives, too. He leads us through our lives. But the thing about Jesus is that he is also a man of his word. You know, throughout his ministry, he doesn't just talk and talk and preach and preach. But, like, he, the way his actions are, it's just, it's the exact same thing from his teachings and his preachings. Because, like, it, it doesn't matter if I'm, like, for example, it doesn't matter if I'm just up here and telling you guys to remain in Jesus, but like, but like you guys can't really imagine it that well. The thing about Jesus, why he was such an influencer <laughs> was that like the way his teachings are, he exemplified it through his own actions, you know, like the way he would help, help the weak, the way he would um, reach out to people that are cast out, you know, like... For example, talking to the woman at the well and all that. You know, um, but Jesus also sets the correct lifestyle that he wants his followers to live, that he wants us to live too. And what's that lifestyle? It's an obedient lifestyle. Obedience is key. So it, it may not seem like it, but like I, I kind of have a problem, you know, like submitting to authority, you know, not like. I run away from the cops or anything, but like, you know, I, if there's sometimes when there's like higher ups, like my boss or maybe a leader or whatever, <coughs> like I, I tend to kind of go against them, I guess. I, I tend to think of like different ways that I could maybe accomplish something rather than what my boss is trying to have it or like whether or like what my leader wants me to do it. And to sum it up, really, though, it's that it's just because that I think I can do better than my boss or my leader. And, but like, you know, I, I don't say that to my boss because I don't want to get fired or anything, you know. Uh, but, like, for a lot of us, it might be, like, a simple or cliche thing to just hear that, like, yeah, you have to obey God's commands or all, all that kind of stuff. You know, you have to obey what Jesus is saying or, like, your whoever preaches up here says to obey God's commands, obey your parents or whatever. But like, it's like we, we still repeat it so many times in church and all that, but like, hey, we still clash with how God wants us to live our lives, you know? Like, we still clash with how Jesus wants us to obey our parents. We still clash with God on like how he wants us to love our enemies. Why? Because... Because sometimes our egos get too big that we think that we can do better than what Jesus is saying, which is, the thing is, like, obedience, it shows surrender. 
Can we say that together? Obedience shows surrender. Oh, that worked nice. Okay. It also shows that we, we don't know the best for ourselves. We, it shows that we know that Jesus, that God knows more about ourselves than we, than we do. So that we trust in the creator that knows everything. And I think verse 11 says it best on why we should be obedient. Um, if you read verse 11 again, it says that I have told you these things so that my joy and delight may be in you and that your joy may be made full, complete, and overflowing. So that when we, when we stay obedient, when we stay obedient to God's words, it's never like the only person that's benefiting it is us, really. You know, so that's why Jesus wants us to be obedient because we, we get this joy, we get this sense of peace, we get this sense of fullness, you know. But the thing is, it's not just like, it's for us too. Uh, because it says here that the joy of the Lord will be made overflowing. So when you obey God, it's not just benefiting you, it's also benefiting the people around you. It's also going to overflow into their lives, you know. Jesus explained it simply, to, that to remain in his love is to obey him obey his commandments and his teaching. So first, remaining in Jesus, it means that we need obedience. So, all right, second up, let's open up to John 15, verses 12 to 13. And can we read this, these verses together? One, two, three. This is my commandment, that you love and unselfishly seek the best for one another, just as I have loved you. No one has greater love nor stronger commitment than to lay down his own life for his friends. Wait, no, just verse uh, 12 to 13. Might be good. Okay, but yeah. So what does abiding in Jesus uh, mean also? Second, it means sacrifice. You know, Jesus' commandment is to love and unselfishly seek the best for one another for one another gosh but so okay we want to be obedient but like what what do i actually have to do the thing is jesus calls us to sacrifice jesus here also set a standard on how the disciples should love love with sacrifice because we because we can easily say to someone that like we love them but we can't we don't show it in any way sort or form you know other than love jesus commandment is like, if you read it again, it says to unselfishly seek the best for one another. But wait, unselfishly seek the best for one another? So that means, like, do things out of love even if you don't get anything in return? Or, like, seek the best for other people even though you don't like them and, you know, they don't like you back? Well, the thing about sacrifice, as Jesus shows us later on, it's also selfless. We don't get anything in re we might not get anything in return, but it is what Jesus commands us to do. For a lot of us, sacrifice can look like, you know, using your personal time to spend with God instead. And or maybe for some of you guys that are serving here today, you know, those of you are already sacrificing your time and energy to be here with us. Or I, I know like a lot of you guys would love to stay in bed at like 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning because I would too. But like we're here because we do want to see the to see Jesus. We want to feel his presence because we want to sacrifice for him. And for others of us, sacrifice can also mean like sacrificing our selfish desires. Like, you know, not going, not turning to our sins, whether it's like, you know, gossiping behind someone's back or even like for uh, others, it, it could be like, you know, sexual immorality or it, those kinds of things, you know. And I think I I do remember a time when I was, um, I started going to college at CCP in my freshman year. I remember that, well, I have so much free time that I could like just do anything I want. But like, you know, like a week goes by and apparently you miss like two tests a few quizzes and homework and notes that are like a textbook long. So it's like, like college just hits you like a truck, you know what I mean? But like, and other than school, like I also had work, I had family, I had like a social life. 
uh, he has a social life, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, even family time too, you know. And the thing is, like when I, like back then when I started college, I, I even thought that like maybe like to make myself, like give myself more time to spend for all these other things, maybe it's like, maybe I should, I don't know, maybe take some time away from ministry. Because back then I was like, man, four four days at church, like, y'all probably only at church for, like, two days max, you know, per week, but I was, like, Thursday, I had, like, this prayer thing for the Indo service, and then uh, Friday, it would be practice at church, and then Saturday, probably, like, AGC practice or whatever, and then, like, Sunday, it would be, like, church service and all that, right? But, like, I, I realized that being rooted in church wasn't really my problem, because being rooted in church in Christ and other Christ-centered Christians, it was what helped me keep on going all along, you know. It, it, it wasn't the church that was a problem. It was that I wasn't managing my time correctly for my own life and for Jesus, for my family, my friends, and all these things, you know. Be because you can't ever go wrong with sacrificing what you have for Jesus if he's the one that's keeping you rooted down, you know. And that's why, like, this life, this life of sacrifice, it's to live a life that is Christ-centered rather than self-centered, you know? It's my time. Okay. So, yeah, first, we got obedience. And what do we have to obey? We have to obey the fact that we need to live a life of sacrifice. So, number three, um, can we go to verse 14 to 15 of John 15? Lit. Okay. Can we read this one together again? One, two, three. You are my friends if you keep on doing what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you my friends, because I have revealed to you everything that I have heard from my father. Amen. The thing is, like right here, Jesus didn't refer to the disciples as servants anymore. He referred to them as his friends, as you can see. He didn't, as friends, he didn't keep secrets from them. Instead, he was openly revealing things of the Father, you know. He revealed things from God the Father. And even in verse 13, if you, go, if you do go back, it says that no greater love than to lay down his own life for his friends, which foreshadows that Jesus is going to die on the cross and here, he didn't lay his life down for his followers. He laid his life down for his friends, you know. And for a lot of us at AGC, like, we, we start fasting. Who, who started fasting with us? Anyone? Nice. Um, but yeah, we started fasting this past Wednesday. And for those of you that don't know or haven't started fasting with, uh, with us yet, the purpose of fasting is to take your focus away from, from the world and direct it to God by temporarily giving up anything to focus on God. It, it can be anything you want, you know. Most people would do food. A lot, uh, a lot of other people would do social media or even games. Personally, I can't do games, so I just stayed with food. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's about managing my time correctly and all that. But, um, but yeah, or even other fleshly desires, as we, as we said before. It could be, like, your sins, or it could be, like, other... Selfish desires, you know. Um, but yeah, the thing is with fasting, we also have to combine it with prayer. Otherwise, fasting without prayer is just dieting. <laughs> if you guys get it. Yeah, it's just dieting or just like staying out of social media because you want to, you know. The thing is, when we pray and fast, first off, fasting, as I said before, it helps us to not be distracted from other things other than Jesus. And prayer, it allows us to actually talk to God and have him talk back to us, you know. It allows uh, God, it allows him to reveal new things to us, new things for our future or whatever it is that you guys are specifically praying about while you're fasting. And another reason for fasting, it also helps us to rely more on God rather than you know, the physical things around us. When Jesus was fasting before he started his ministry, he fasted and 
there was a devil tempting him the whole time, right? Like, he was giving him, like, three challenges. Like, yeah, if you're hungry, then, you know, turn that stone into bread. Or if, like, if you bow down to me right now, you will have this whole kingdom. And I think the third one was that um, if he really was the son of God, uh, the devil tempted him to just jump off a cliff. And I know that a bunch of angels will just carry you, you know. But the thing was, this was the example of fasting that Jesus wants us to do, you know. Even though we crave, we have this fleshly cravings to like, you know, to eat or even just like to go on social media or whatever. You know, uh, Jesus here tells us that that the Lord still provides because after those temptations, an angel appeared and gave him food and fed him, you know. This makes us more reliant to God than ourselves. It makes us Jesus-reliant than self-reliant. Uh, I think that's the word. So what does remaining in Jesus means for us believers? It means we need obedience. It means we need to sacrifice. And we also have intimacy with Jesus. But, you know, like, the irony of these verses is that there was already one disciple missing when Jesus talked about, you know, closeness and, you know, sacrificing for him and all this. And that one, if you guys could guess, the one disciple was Judas. Judas already left the room before Jesus could talk about all these great things about being friends with everyone else, you know. And, but why is, but why is that? Well, so, some of us tend to give up early on Jesus because, because like, maybe we need to obey Man, like, uh, maybe you guys are rebellious like me. You know, maybe you do think that you know better than Jesus. Or maybe for some of us, maybe we do obey God. But when God calls us to sacrifice, we're like, nah, that's, that's like too much work. That's like too high of a price to pay. You know, I got to, like, I'm already obeying you. I'd rather, I'll literally do anything else but sacrifice for you. Maybe that's for some of us. But why is that? Because we live in a world that where it's easy. You know, we live in a world that offers us things that are instant, immediate, you know, that things that give us a temporary pleasure or temporary highs and all that. But the thing is, I also got this quote from a friend, but the thing is, when we follow Jesus, it means not getting to follow anyone else, you know. And now if you, I, I don't have this verse up on the screen, but um if you do read John 15, verses 16 through 17 on your own time, it says this. It says that you didn't choose me. I chose you. Jesus was saying this. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. You know, uh, can, I, can I have the worship team come up to Ashley? But here God... But here Jesus says that before we ever chose him, he already chose us first, you know? And for this reason, like, why he wants us to remain in his love is because that he wants us to produce fruit that are forever lasting, forever like this, you know, so that other people can experience it too. The thing is, some of us are probably burdened. I know personally, like when I was making this sermon, I feel like, like, not going to lie, I made this sermon, like, kind of last minute, probably just, like, in a span of a week. And that's not an achievement. That's just me delaying things because I felt like I have, like, other things going on. So I, I just delayed it and felt like I didn't want to do it, you know. We tell God, I want to remain with you. I want to be close to you. But sometimes we don't have the capacity to do so, you know. I remember when I, I was actually, I started making this sermon um, I teared up a bit because I, I wrote down that maybe we don't want to give our hearts to Jesus because in the past, like we did give our hearts to someone else, but it was mistreated, you know. Maybe we're scared to give it to Jesus because we have this past, this, this past memory, this past trauma that like maybe Jesus will do the same thing as that other person did, you know. But the thing is, Jesus wants us to follow him. He wants us to obey him, to be, um, to sacrifice to him, and also to be intimate with him. You know, 
And he says, this is my command, love each other. But how can I love? But how can I love? On verse 16, it says that he already chose us. The thing is, I can, I can love other people because Jesus already loved me first. The most famous verse, John 3, 16, you know, if you guys know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I remember I was talking with one of my one of the church leaders here and he, he was telling me like imagine the king of kings he was like at the top of the top he was on the highest throne and he decided to just take all of that off take off his robe you know take off his crown and go down to this garbage planet earth you know to actually want to be with us to call us his friends the thing is when he came down here, he also knows that, you know, everyone's is, everyone is messed up. He was the only good person that ever walked the earth. But yet people still treated him poorly. He's still like, he, Jesus poured out his heart to his followers, to his disciples. But, you know, in the end, one disciple still uh, betrayed him, had him arrested. The people of Jerusalem that followed him turned on him, you know, spat at him, talked bad about him, and even helped crucif uh, crucify him too. But Jesus still says that he still wants to remain in the love of the Father. And that's what he's saying to his disciples. And that's what he wants us to do also. You know, because the greatest act of love this world has ever seen still required a sacrifice. Can we close our hands and close our eyes and we'll pray together. God, I, I don't know what a lot of us are going through here, Lord Jesus. But we do know, Lord, that we want to remain in your love. We want to stay with you, God, because that's... Because you're the only constant thing that we know because the, this world can give us things that are temporary but it's not actually it doesn't fulfill us you know we we try to fill this god-shaped hole in the heart in our hearts with things of the world with pleasure with sin with you know just but what it actually does it it lets us to it makes us to stray away from you, God. God, we have nothing else to give to you but ourselves, our hearts, Lord Jesus. And God, teach us. Teach us how to obey you. Teach us how to sacrifice for you. Teach us how we can be more intimate with you, Lord Jesus. Can we sing this song together?